Good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Tim Pace. Uh, I think uh, Mark already said that. I'm the, I'm the pastor of adult ministries and community life here at Trinity. I do want to take just a second again to, uh, to welcome you here today. Whether you're here uh, with us in person or whether you're online, I'm really glad that you're here and uh, we all are. You know, at Trinity, we talk a lot about uh, how we're like family here. And that really isn't just lip service. We truly do see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Through happy times or tough times, healthy or lean, we stick together because we know that all of us really are better than one of us. We use this language not because it it sounds cool or because it brings up certain emotions, but because it reminds us that we have the same Father. No, we're not all naturally born siblings, but rather we are adopted into the family of God, and that's a family bond that can never be broken for eternity. I have the privilege this morning of uh, kicking off our fall sermon series, Sons and Daughters, and for the next 10 weeks, we're going to unpack what it really means to be uh, in the family of God. What are the implications of that? So before I begin, uh, please pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for our church family, and thank you for uh, our family with a, with a big F, like all over the world, that we are siblings together uh, in your family because of what Jesus did for us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that that would become uh, more and more, uh, just uh, that we will become more and more aware of that uh, in our lives and the implications of that and just be overflowed, overflowed with joy because of what you've done for us. I pray in Jesus' name that you would do that this morning. Amen. You know, a little more than 12 years ago, I walked through what was really the biggest spiritual desert of my life uh, to this point. I had been working day and night to build a business, and I thought that uh, it, that, that business was going to be a great thing for, uh, uh, for my family. I mean, it meant financial security. It meant something that I could be proud of. Hopefully, it was something that I was going to be able to leave behind for my family. Our son Carter had just turned four. We were pursuing adopting another child at the time. We'd begun to remodel our house, and generally speaking, when I looked at our life, I thought everything was uh, uh, very positive. And then one Friday night, everything changed. My business partner uh, I, uh, I initiated what became a hostile takeover of our company. Within a few weeks, uh, everything that I thought was good news in our life at that point was, was kind of taken away. Gone was the money that we had saved for adoption. Gone uh, was the business that I was so proud of. Gone was the financial security. And gone were our plans for a prosperous future. It was hard. The relationship that I had with my wife, Janita, had already been weakened because of all the hours I was sinking into to trying to start this business. And now it was even more rocky because of, the, uh, of, of what was going on. Making the mortgage payment became nearly impossible and job prospects just were non-existent. We were forced at that time to to move to North Carolina to try to make a fresh start. Shortly after we arrived there, I asked an old friend of mine if there was a men's Bible study that I could uh, get into. And as it it happened, there was one. It was just about to start, and I even knew a couple of the guys that, uh, that were in that study. And even though I had already been a Christian for many years, I had been through Bible college, I had attended church my whole life, and even worked, at, uh, it even worked in churches, the entire paradigm of my faith in God changed during that study. It was, a, it was like I'd never heard the gospel before. The first, I felt joy in the Lord uh, and in my life that I hadn't felt in years. My marriage didn't just start to have new life. It had become stronger than it had ever been. And people around me started to notice that something was different. They began to ask me about it. The gospel really had revolutionized my life. No, my circumstances didn't change. I was still working the graveyard shift in a factory. We were living in a house that uh, wasn't ours. A a family member had graciously let us live there for free. Our budget still didn't work out on paper to end in the black. But joy was back in my life, and I mean with a capital J. For many of you, 2020 has been like a desert perhaps even spiritually. The seemingly endless dunes of this desert have been disorienting. Many of the elements of the life that you once counted on 
have been lost, maybe forever. Perhaps you're wondering, when is relief coming? Sure, you believe in God, but you feel somehow more distant from Him. You find yourself asking, where is the good news? Where has my security gone? Maybe you're asking, where is my joy gone? Well, I do have good news for you this morning. For the next 10 weeks, we're going to follow the outline of that Bible study that I, that I did with those men uh, uh, 12 years ago. We're going to dive deep into the Word of God, and we're going to discover afresh the good news that's for us there. And this isn't just some good news. This is the good news. And it's not just for us. It's for everyone. I want to encourage you during this next 10 weeks to share this news. Share what, what you're learning and what God's telling you. Preach it to yourself. Preach it to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers and neighbors. As you feel the joy come back into your life or start to grow again, just simply tell others why that's happening. The more that you drink in the good news of the gospel, the more you're going to be surprised at how easily and naturally it overflows into your conversations and your relationships. Each week we're going to give you a question or a discussion topic for you to, uh, to, you, for you to discuss at home with your family or, or maybe in your community groups or with some of your friends. And then I just ask you to be prayerfully expectant. Expect to have your motivation to show and share the love of Jesus grow. Expect your view of God and His love for you to grow. And expect your joy to return. Now I realize that those are big expectations, but I promise God is a big God. In fact, He says that He can do abundantly more than we can even ask or imagine. So buckle up. Expect big things from our big God. But how does all this come from just looking at God and understanding our relationship with Him? I think you're going to see that over the next 10 weeks. You just have to keep coming back, right? For the time that I have left this morning, I want to explore three reasons why you may have lost your joy or at least seen it diminish through this season. The first one is that you may have forgotten where you came from. And second, you may have believed something to be good news that actually wasn't good news at all. And third, you may not fully understand how much that you're worth to God. Please turn with me uh, in your Bibles or your Bible app, or uh, also the words are going to be up on the screen, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 1 through 10. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there, are some who, <clears throat> but there are some who trouble you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want to introduce two families this morning and ask you to remember your birth family. The first reason that you may have lost your joy is that you may not remember where you came from or you may have forgotten where you came from. Now, the word translated deliver in verse 4 can also be translated rescue. But why would God need to rescue us? Why would Paul use that language? Well, all of us were once spiritual orphans. We were born into a different kind of family, one that was intent on destroying us. The Apostle John actually describes those who aren't in the family of God as children of the devil in 1 John chapter 3. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, 
Paul uses a very similar language, and he calls those who aren't in the family of God children of darkness in Ephesians 5. Being born into a certain family is not a problem that we can cure ourselves. We didn't choose to be born into the family of the devil, to be children of darkness, as, as uh, Paul describes us. But we were, and we were in need of, of rescuing. The first key to really understanding the good news is being able to accept uh, and, and being able to accept it as this. I like to use the words of uh, the, the late pastor and, and seminary professor, Jack Miller. He's the one who wrote the Bible study that we're using the outline for. Uh, and he said it this way, cheer up, you're far worse than you think you are. <laughs> we have to understand that. We have to really grasp that and own it. We may not have always been able to see it, but without Jesus, we aren't doing well in life. Sure, we may have affluence, we may have strong family, great health or physical gifts. But Scripture says that we were children of the devil, trapped in Satan's family with all of its destructive patterns. That life, that family, was all we knew, and we couldn't see clearly how doomed we were if we were going to be left there. No, Jesus didn't come to add something great to our lives. He came to give us an entirely new life. He made a way for us to be adopted out of our lives of, as spiritual orphans. With this new life, we have a new destiny, a new calling, a new purpose, a new strength, a new family. We were born into one family, but now we are in God's family. If you believe in, in, in Jesus and what he did for us, then Jesus is now your brother. Through faith in Him and by the will of God, who we can now call Father, we're heirs to God's estate. No one can take us from His family. Now, I mentioned earlier that Janita and I have longed uh, for many years to adopt. Only recently has that dream started to become a reality. Some of you know that we are in the process now of adopting a second son. We have a natural-born son, Carter. He's 16 years old. And then just this past June, Matthew moved in with us. He's 13, and we're currently in the middle of a six-month foster period. And in December, Lord willing, we're going to be able to finalize his adoption. You see, Matthew was naturally born into a different family. In many ways, that family was unhealthy for him. It's so much so, in fact, that the state determined that he needed to be rescued They took him away from a destructive family system and began to look for a healthier family to place him into. And this process of adoption uh, has, and, and especially through the foster system, has helped me to understand on a whole different level what Jesus did for us. It's been a huge blessing. Now, this wasn't so much the case for Matthew, but it is, it is pretty common among foster kids that when the state does step in to rescue them, that they don't want to go. Sometimes they love the life that they're familiar with so much that they fight to stay in it. Rather than taking the risk of entering the unknown, they can even become angry sometimes or resentful at the social worker who pulled them away from the life that they once knew. And this phenomenon is not exclusive to foster kids. We read about it in the book of Exodus as the children of Israel started their, uh, started their exodus. At first, they were happy to leave Egypt, but then soon they discovered that they missed some things about Egypt. The vegetables, the the greenery, the, the, the abundant food and stuff like that. And they quickly forgot that they had been mistreated as slaves for years. The devil wants us, too, to believe that we're doing just fine before Jesus rescued us. Satan is the master of distorting the truth. He blurs the way that we remember the past and the way that we see the present. So if you're lacking joy this morning, consider this. You may not remember where you came from. That you were hopelessly trapped in a family system that, wasn't going to, that was going to end in your destruction. You were in desperate need of rescue and Jesus was the only one who could do it. Or maybe you're here this morning and you just now are becoming aware for the first time that you are in need of rescue. You've been trusting your current system of life to ultimately save you. You're hoping that when you stand before God, 
that your good deeds will somehow outweigh your bad deeds on God's cosmic scale and that he'll let you into his kingdom because of your life and your track record. To thousands of people all over the world, having that kind of control of your own spiritual destiny sounds like good news. But make no mistake, it isn't. No, accept no imitation. You have to keep the good news the good news. The second reason that you may have lost your joy this morning is that you may have believed something to be good news that wasn't actually good news at all. Let's look back at the central text for today, starting in verse 6. Paul says, I am astonished that you so quickly are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I'm saying again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, the Galatians had fallen into the trap of listening to and believing a false gospel. There are two primary categories of, of false gospel uh, in the Bible the, <clears throat> and that, uh, that people can fall into. The first, I call Jesus or something. Jesus or something. And the other category is Jesus plus something. Any religion or non-religion for that matter that falls into one of these two categories and you can describe it that way might sound like good news to you at first, but it's actually a false gospel. And Paul's saying here that that will end in your destruction. In the first category, the false good news has you believe that there is another way to get into God's family other than your adoption through Christ. Today, this takes many forms. One I already mentioned, like like uh, the belief that your good deeds can somehow outweigh your bad deeds uh, at the end of your life, and that will get you into heaven. Other people believe that because their parents had such a strong faith, uh, that surely that, that they'll kind of be somehow tagged onto their parents' faith, and then that's going to be okay for them, uh, for them later in life. Other religions uh, uh, offer other, other ways to get to heaven besides uh, through Christ. So there's alternatives to Jesus. Paul says that that is a false gospel. I could go on and on, but you do get the picture. If you believe that there's another way into the family of God other than through faith in Jesus, then you're believing a false gospel this morning. You're believing something that may sound like good news, but it really isn't. One of my favorite activities is to hike. I've hiked hundreds of miles on all kinds of different trails. I love it. If there's one thing that every hiker knows, it's that believing you're on the right trail doesn't make it true that you're on the right trail. I've been there quite a few times. And if you stay on the wrong trail long enough, it can take you far away from the destination that you had in mind when you started down the trail. This is what Paul's saying. You see, Paul had met the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. He learned firsthand that he... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life like we sang about earlier. <clears throat> Paul then shared the truth of, of Jesus with the Galatians. The Galatians were Gentiles who had never heard of Jesus or Christianity. And, the Gen- and, and these Galatians believed. And that started the first church in Galatia. According to verse 6, not long after this happened, then they were persuaded by former Jews that even though Jesus was the Son of God and is the way to life in God's family, that there's actually more to it. They were taught and they believed that faith in Christ wasn't enough. And that's the second category of false gospel, isn't it? Jesus plus something. The former Jews who began to teach the young Christians in Galatia, they believed in Jesus, but they taught that in order for God to really be pleased with them, if God is actually going to love them, They needed to continue in the Jewish customs, and in particular, circumcision and the Jewish feasts. There's a lot that I could say about that, but for the sake of time, I'll just give you a quick summary. All of the rituals and feasts and sacrifices that made up the Old Testament law were instituted by God in order to point to Jesus. 
Over the years, the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders in Judaism, began to add more and more rules over and above what God had laid out. Those rules didn't point to Christ. Instead, they pointed to man. The better you could keep the rules, the more pride that you can have in your ability to keep them. When Jesus did come in the flesh, the Pharisees, who had spent their lives studying the law that was meant to point forward to Jesus, didn't even recognize him. When Jesus said during his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 that he had come not to abolish the law but to fulfill it, they couldn't believe it. You see, in the Pharisees' mind, everyone had to fulfill the law for themselves. Paul himself had been trained as a Pharisee, and he was so zealous in religion that he murdered Christians until he met Jesus. Jesus told Paul that in his zeal for religion, he was actually doing damage to the true family of God, and by extension, even to Christ himself. So I'm asking you, are you believing a false gospel this morning? Are you striving hard to earn God's love? Do you believe that you actually have the ability to keep the law for yourself as the Pharisees did? Because the thing is, you can't. But the true gospel says that you don't have to. You see, Jesus kept the law perfectly, and believing that he did that for you, that gives you his perfect record, the scripture says. For all who believe in Jesus, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more or any less than he does right now. I'm going to say that again. If you believe in Christ and you have Christ's record, there's nothing that you could do to make God love you any more or any less than he does right now at this moment. And that's great news. And if there were something you could do to mess that up, then Jesus' sacrifice would have been in vain. There are many forms of false good news that sound good, but Paul is crystal clear. There is no other gospel other than faith alone in Christ alone. Now finally, we need to understand that free doesn't mean it's cheap. Consider the price that was paid for your adoption. The third and final reason that you may have lost your joy is this. You may not really understand how much you're worth to God. You may not really understand how much you're worth to God. Paul uses very strong letter in this letter, a very strong language in this letter. He says that those who preach a false gospel will be accursed. Literally what he's saying is that that if you're preaching a false gospel, you need to be damned. In other words, you need to go stand before God and be judged for what you've done and the damage that you've caused. Why is he so passionate? One obvious reason is one that we've already talked about, that preaching the false gospel doesn't lead to God. It leads to destruction. But the other reason that Paul uses such strong language is because people, if, they're, if they are preaching a false gospel, they don't understand how much uh, it costs to purchase their legal adoption into the family of God. You see, our adoption into God's family doesn't cost us anything. It's free for us, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. This is also something that our personal adoption process with Matthew has, has helped me to see in a whole new way in these, in these last few months. You know, we were a happy family before. Janita and Carter and I, we enjoyed each other. We were comfortable with how things worked and who we were, but we wanted a bigger family. And when we met Matthew, we instantly knew that we wanted to adopt him. We loved him right away. And we also knew that on some level, adopting another child was going to change things in our family. It was going to switch up the dynamic. Carter would no longer be an only child. He would now have a brother to share his life with and his stuff with. As parents, we have, the same, we have this awesome experience of now we get to have two sons to love, but we also have two sons to feed, to clothe, two sons to drive to school. There is double the joy for us, but also double the responsibility. And as much as we welcome it, there are times when it hasn't been easy. You see, adoption is a long process. We have to pursue it with great effort. There's classes and paperwork getting our house ready for another person to move in. Then both the state of Minnesota and the state where Matthew is from have different requirements that they have us uh, to fulfill. 
We knew it was going to take dedication and sacrifice to meet all the requirements. Carter also had to be willing to sacrifice. None of this was going to work if he wasn't willing to share his family with someone else that he really barely knew at the time. We had lots of family conversations about this before Matthew moved in. We all had to be willing to do what it took to rescue Matthew from a family system that uh, was being destructive to him. Similarly, God looked at humanity and he said that he wanted to adopt us into his family. He knew that if we were left in our natural born families that we would be doomed. I can't imagine what those family conversations sounded like in heaven. Okay, Jesus, we both know that we want to rescue these humans from the life and their family system. But it's, not, it's going to be very costly. The only way to make this adoption legal is for you to leave all the comfort of heaven, to leave our perfect relationship. You're going to be born as a human. You'll grow up and live as a light among all these children of darkness. You will model for them how life can be for those who are in our family. But the humans aren't going to understand their need to be rescued. They will hate you for even trying. They won't want to leave the, fa- the life that they've always known. And it's going to be excruciating for you. The people that you came to save, the people that you are sacrificing so much to adopt, they're not going to be thankful for it. They're going to spit on you, beat you, make fun of you, deny you, betray you, and ultimately they're going to murder you. And you are going to let that happen because you love them so much. Willingly laying down your perfect life for them is what's required to make the adoption legal. I can't imagine the love that it took to do that. Can you? Jack Miller said it this way, cheer up, you're more loved than you can possibly imagine. What hit me in a whole new way when I was preparing for this sermon was, as much as I love Matthew and I long to adopt Matthew, I also love Carter. I want to minimize the sacrifices that he has to make for the adoption to be possible. If the only way to adopt Matthew was for Carter to die, I couldn't have done it. I love Matthew. I love him so much. And I would personally do anything within my power to make it possible to adopt him. But any loving parent also knows that it's far more agonizing to watch your child suffer than for you to suffer yourself. But that's what God did. Jesus was willing to lay down and die so that we could be adopted. And God loved us so much that he watched him do it. That's how much you're worth to God. If you're struggling with a lack of joy right now, remember where you came from. Ask yourself if you're believing something to be good news that isn't good news. And spend time meditating on the love that God has for you. He demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For Janita and Carter and I, there's one more step remaining in the adoption process for us to legally adopt Matthew. We have to go before a judge to prove that we've done everything needed to adopt. And then, once all those things are completed, Matthew will have a choice to make. As a 13-year-old, he has the right to veto uh, the adoption. We can have done everything needed to qualify for a legal adoption, but in the end, he can say no. He can say, I want to stay in the life that I've known before that was familiar to, to him. And it's no different for us. God has done all the things that he needs to do to be able to, Uh, to adopt us legally. It costs more than we can even imagine, and still, we do have the choice to say no. We can reject God. We can choose to continue as spiritual orphans. We We can continue to fend for ourselves. We can continue to look for a family that might be better than his family. We can continue to live in our family system like we've always known refusing to believe that it will end in our destruction. Are you believing a false gospel this morning? 
How's your joy level? If it's low, it might be because you've never seen or you've lost sight of the true gospel that we're talking about this morning, the good news of Jesus. Our big idea this morning is that the good news brings real joy in any circumstance. The good news brings real joy in any circumstance. And I want to give you a couple of different ways to respond this morning. In a moment, the band is going to come and play. There are going to be people down front to pray with you if you'd like. If you need to come and repent of believing in a false gospel, you can do that this morning. You can pray alone or you can ask someone to pray with you. If this is the first time that you've understood the gospel and heard it as good news, I want to encourage you to confess your faith in Jesus as the only one who makes it possible for you to join in God's family. And if you're concerned about social distancing or if you're watching from home, you don't even have to leave your seat. You can pray to Jesus right now, right where you're at. I encourage you to tell him that you now understand what he did for you that you believe in him, and that you want to be part of his family. That's it. That's the whole gospel. There's nothing that needs to be added to it, and there's no other way. And finally, you can also respond in this way. This week, while you have a family meal or a family devotion, perhaps in your community group or with some friends, consider these questions. In light of this sermon... What reason for losing your joy do you most identify with and why? And the second question, how does the good news of Jesus bring back joy? You can find these questions online or on your Trinity app. And now as the band comes, I want to ask, how is Jesus calling you to respond to the good news this morning? How is Jesus calling you to respond to the good news this morning? Please stand with me as I pray and the, and the band begins to play, play. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for being willing to do everything that it took to adopt us. Lord, we confess that we, that we sometimes lose sight of that, that we can sometimes forget where we came from, that we so desperately needed you and where we were, that I, the end of our life was going to be destruction without you. I'm sorry that we forget that or lose sight of that. I'm sorry that sometimes we we take advantage of our uh, adoption into your family. But Lord, we love you. We're glad to be in your family. I just pray that you would uh, show us new and fresh ways uh, to recognize that in our lives this morning. And I do pray for those who don't know you, uh, who are just realizing that they were believing in in a false gospel this morning. I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give them courage and faith and help them uh, to believe and confess to you uh, and and join your family. You've uh, You've opened the door for that, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.